And not only is it practical design, but it applies to any type of thinking, even in terms of like software development. Uh, it's not so obvious, and a lot of people try to say, well, I've done that all my life. That's the way I've always written software. Well, no, it's not. Uh, there are some subtleties to it that you only pick up with experience, but uh, it's interesting to see some of the uses that this can be put to. And we actually, after we had this lecture, we'll have a lot of the groundwork laid for actually building the internals of a microprocessor. If you understand this fully, you shouldn't be afraid of going into Intel and saying, I want a job in designing microprocessors, because you'd have you know, the first step up toward doing something like that. Now, they probably wouldn't hire you, but that's a different story. So let's look at the course outline here. My window got so squashed. We're tonight going to start talking about finite state machines, which are also called automatons. A-U-T-O-M-A-T-O-N-S, or automana, if you use the Latin plural. And... But what they basically are, are a way in hardware to remember where you are and what can possibly follow. Now, implied in that may be some history about where you have been, but it's usually more in a forward direction. The history of where you've been can be cloudy because you can arrive into a particular state from many, many different ways. Uh, you know, if, if I see you at the diner, you know, and you're sitting there eating your lunch, you know, I know you're in the diner and, and you can, we can talk about where you're going from here, but I can't intuit how you got there. I don't know what happened before you got to the diner. Could have been doing lots of different things and they led to a state called eating at the diner. And so just the observation of a physical state can tell us where we can go from here. I mean, we're going to go running out because of a fire. We're going to go running out because we've finished eating. We're going to stay in the diner longer. But those type of state and pieces of information we can deduce. But we can't really necessarily say that, oh, you got here by way of the barber shop. We don't necessarily know that, but you might have. So a finite state machine is a way of looking at a lot of the things that we've been doing and kind of putting them all together into a practical something. This is a practical application of all the Boolean algebra and a lot of the sequential logic that we've previously talked about. Now, if you notice, we're moving pretty quickly toward this first exam. I actually looked at the calendar, and it looks like your exam is going to be on November 2nd, which is a Monday night. You want to write that down. November 2nd, which is a Monday night, and the first exam should be that night. Now, if we get behind a little, that could be pushed beyond. It will not be pulled back towards us. It'll be either here or later. But right now, Unit 16 for this class is scheduled for November the 2nd, the Monday night. So you'll have the whole weekend to prepare for it. Um, we, we have a bunch of material. I, I know that these just look like a bunch of just scattered words and things, but there's some very important stuff in these lessons that follow finite state machines. But they really didn't make sense until we had talked about the machines. So does anybody have any questions about that or when the first test is? Anybody want to uh, ask me anything about the test at this point? So, I don't know everything about it. What, what's your question? Uh, well, well, I'll ask more thorough questions at the end. So, But, but basically what you said is that the earliest that the test will be is on November 2nd? Right now, that's the case. Yeah, that, I guess that could change if we got hit by lightning, but that's not. it's likely to be that or later. It'll okay. probably be November 2nd unless we have system problems. But I can get through all this material in that time, even if we were to miss a night. We just have to compound some of it. So it, it, it can't be pushed uh, earlier, and it's unlikely to be pushed backwards, so it's probably going to be on the November 2nd. I right now would plan for November 2nd. Okay. And matter of fact, I am planning for November 2nd. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, uh, Professor, it's going to be in the same format as the, uh, the quiz we did last time, right? That's right. I'm going to have you download an individual test. It's been customized just for you. And... You will have a, 
amount of time during class to take it. Okay, if it's an hour, you'll have an hour. If it's an hour and a half, you'll have an hour and a half. If uh, when you get done, you're going to email me the text file, which is the test and answer key. So you're going to basically do the same thing you did, which is you'll figure out what the answer is. You put the answer between the angle brackets. And then when you're all done, you'll mail back to me, email to me, and you'll receive back from me or one of my assistants a thing that says thanks, which that, it's not, it won't sound like it's real polite. It's just going to say thanks, which means we got it. And we looked at the thing, and there's at least answers on the test sheet. I've had people send back blank test sheets. You know, they put the answer on a piece of paper and forgot to turn it in, or they emailed me their lunch. I don't know. Something different happened. So we like to check to make sure we actually got it, because you can't be turned in late. It has to be turned in within the window of time you've been allocated. If you've been given an accommodation by the uh, accommodation center, whatever their name is, I forget, uh, we'll work that out. You need to make sure you've contacted me prior to the test if you're one of those people. But um, the test can't be taken late. It has to be started when it starts. If you if I started at 6 and you get it here at 6.01, you're going to miss some instructions and probably do something wrong. That's the only thing we'll be doing that night. But you will, even if you finish in the first five minutes, have to come back to class after the time period just to re-verify with me that I actually have your test. So you're not going to be, you know, run scot-free by just taking a five-minute test and then have the rest of the evening. You'll still have to dedicate the evening to it, but um, more than likely it won't take the entire class period because, as I recall, it's not that long a test. There's a lot of material to be tested, but in a single question, I can ask you about a lot of things. Anybody have any questions about that? Everybody's looking forward to the test, I assume. This will be your chance to prove to me that you are the A student. I have a question, Professor. Yeah, uh, Robert. I can't remember if you said if we're going to have a review day or not. Not for this test. OK. OK. I could on the Friday before the test, but I typically, when I do this, nobody shows up. I could hold an hour-long review on that Friday night. If you're interested in that, ask me that week because I, you know, I could do that. But usually Friday night's a bad night. We also don't know the school does weird things on the weekend. And so it may be that we have no way to uh, make contact with each other anyway. But sometimes I do a review for this beforehand. But usually if you, if you look at your notes and you, you know, discuss with other people in the class things that you've had you, that you had problems with, they may not have had problems with them. You'll be fine. You know, see, I would start now practicing doing some of the things from back at the beginning, like can I write things in ASCII odd parity? Do I remember how to write infinity in IEEE 754 floating point? Do I know how to do surrogate pairs? You know, do I remember in a 555 timer how to determine whether the initial value is off or on on pen 3? All of those sorts of things. You could be studying in advance of this. Anybody else have any? Nobody's asked. I think he already asked me, which is why you're not, which is what the format of the test is. And I don't have a good answer for that other than to say it will include true-false. It will include matching. It will include multiple choice, multiple selection, and fill in the blank. I don't believe this one has any essay questions, but I know there are some that involve you actually having to design something. In particular, I think you're going to have to design a finite state machine. But um, yeah, obviously, the answer won't be that entire thing coming back to me. It'll be some equations that describe what you designed. But since we haven't talked about them yet, you don't even know what I'm talking about yet. So after, after we've had this class and next, it'll be able to make a little more sense to you. OK, everybody give me a green light. Let me know you're really in your chair. Okay. Looks like everybody but Thomas got to the green button in time. That's good. Okay. So, new topic finite state machines. I'm going to preface this a little bit with just kind of a description of how these might be useful and work our way into understanding uh, what they are, how we internally 
think of them being structured, how they are physically structured, and then if we were designing one, how we could determine what the equations are in order to be able to build one that could do useful stuff. So let's, uh, I probably need to have paint open somewhere here, so let me grab a copy of paint. And let's do something. Actually, we'll start in Notepad. We'll even be simpler. We were able to build a counter last time by rearranging flip-flops in such a way that the bits turned on in a particular pattern every time we received a clock. Now, we might have a need sometime to build a pattern that is different from that notion. Let's say, for example, oops. which is the repeat of the first pattern again, so I'll leave it off. Let's say we wanted to cycle some LEDs through this pattern. We don't know which is off and which is on. We'll pretend like the ones are on for now. So we'd see the light on the left move in and go back out again. And then after this, we'd go back to the beginning. So it would look like they were meet, the LEDs were meeting in the middle and then splitting again. And we probably don't have a flip-flop design already built up to handle this. There are a couple things which are kind of interesting in it. Uh, one thing is they don't all have the same number of ones. So that means that we kind of have to be able to handle an arbitrary number of ones. Might be zero to, in this case, five. So we know that any of the things that we've done, like passing a one around and like a shift register or a ring counter or something like that, won't be applicable to this. We also note that two times in this, we have the same pattern. But the thing that follows it is not the same. So if we have this pattern, we're followed by that pattern. But if we have the pattern at this point in time, we're followed by this. So we can't really use the pattern of LEDs to tell us what to expect next. So we have to think about this as being, you know, the output of our, in our case, a state machine, and how we would go about tracking what's going on. Well, one of the things we could do is we could label each of these. Let's say I'm just going to use the alphabet here. And this isn't hex digits. This is just the alphabet. And I could say B always follows A, C follows B, D follows C, and A follows D. So now I've disambiguated what to do after this, because I've got a different name for that bit pattern, even though the bit pattern is the same. So if I could somehow encode a name for these and then refer to the names, meaning what comes next, as opposed to the actual outputs, I'd have a fairly useful way to generate a sequence of outputs by saying, I'm at the moment, I'm in state D. What state should follow D? Well, in our case, A should follow D. Well, if I was in state B, what state should follow that? State C. So by having a notion of being in a particular state, we can say that in this state, we're going to produce these outputs. And although I might not know how I got to state B, in this case, I can just look and see, well, I got there by being in state A. But I know that that could have been another state in front of it because when I get to D, if I look at the outputs, I got there by way of state C. But I do know if I'm in state D, the next state I'm going to expect is state A. Now let's assume for whatever reason, I can move either backwards or forwards through this list. In that case, I have some sort of input telling me what way I'm headed at the point when I'm in a particular state. So if I'm in state A, 
and the input says go forward, the next place I'm going to be is state B. If I'm in state A and the input says go backwards, the next place I'm going to wind up is D. So again, in this case, if I know what state I'm in, I don't know if I got there from C or from A if I'm in D. I don't know if I got in B from A or C. So there's some confusion about where I've been. But there's no confusion about where I'm going if I know what my state is and what the current input is. Does everybody see that? Give me a green light if you kind of see what I'm talking about. Okay, there's a couple people that are still confused, but I think as we move along, it will tend to make more sense because more than, more than not, took a good look at that. Now, we have four states, and we've named them A, B, C, and D. Well, those names are no good unless they were hex values, and then they're too, probably too big for the value we need. Let's assume I have four somethings I have to represent. Let's say I have the colors red, green, blue, and yellow. What's the minimum number of bits that I can use in order to represent each of those colors as a uh, unique bit combination? Zachary, do you have any ideas? No. Gabriel, do you have any? Okay, William? Three. Okay, we could use three bits. Now let's see what we would do if we had three bits. We could assign zero, zero, zero to red. We could assign zero, one, zero to green. We could assign one, one, one to blue. I need another unique one. Maybe we say one, one, zero, zero to yellow. Well, I know that there are four more bit patterns that I didn't use. Would it be possible, you think, to encode this in two bits instead of three? Oscar, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Okay, so basically if I get rid of the last bit here, I've used up all the two-bit combinations. As a matter of fact, I've actually put them in what's called gray code order. Remember, we use that with Carnell maps, where he goes the first one, second one, skip to the fourth one, come back to the third one. So accidentally, we numbered it in gray code ordering. So they don't have these. Obviously, there's no particular uh, ordering to these. I put RGB, so there's kind of an implied you know, color wheel order there. But we also know yellow really sits between blue and green. So it's not really in order for any reason. So these numbers don't mean anything other than they're unique. Let's assume for a second that I somebody told me, I want you to preserve as state the days of the week. How many bits minimum do I need? What minimum? Simon Leon, what do you think? Three. Why would I use three? Two to the third is eight, and there's seven days in a week. And why would I why would I use eight instead of four? Yeah, why did I round up to the eight and set it down to the four? Because um, you would need to account for all seven days. Right, 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 right. I'm a pilot, right? So I go fly. I have access to a four-seat plane and a six-seat plane. I have five passengers. Should I take the four-seat plane or should I take the six-seat plane? Hmm. Yeah, obviously, same thing here. If we use two bits, which would be for the four, we would have some days of the week we couldn't have unique bit patterns for. So your answer was 100% right. So you got the A right now. Don't lose it. You keep it for the evening. So 
We might just put them in order, right? So, you know, this is, I'm not going to write all these down, but it would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Or I use the school's abbreviation for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And some reason they don't disambiguate those. And we have one down here that we should never have. We have to deal with it and understand it's there, but we would not assign a state to it. If we ever wound up in it, we consider ourselves in an illegal state or an error state. In programming, that would often be the error state. And we'd have to do something about it. Very often in hardware, what we do is if we wind up in this state, we dump ourselves into a valid state. Now, if we don't know what day it is, it's hard to pick which one of these is the correct one. But it's better than being in the unknown state unless we're going to process this uniquely as an error state, which is probably the right thing to do. So let's assume that we went out and we you know, found... Uh, teacher from a school and the teacher tells tells us I have 89 students in my class I'm trying to turn off my caps lock there how many bits do I need to represent 89 things Anitja and then uh, who was that name went flying back too fast Ryan I'll go to Ryan um, is it six? Well, how many? How many? What's two to the sixth? One twenty-eight. Well, it could be, but it's not. I. Uh, you forgot that one. Okay. Anybody else want to help him out? Sixty-four. Sixty-four is two to the sixth. That's right. So sixty-four is too small. So here's no. He's right. Then. Right, and you're right about 127 is the, it's really 128 is the next power above that. And 128 would certainly be bigger than 89, and it's bigger than 64, so we'd have to pick the one that fits. And um, we have to remember, when we say it's 2 to the 7th, which is the 128, what we're doing is we're really saying it's the number 0 to 127, Right, because we always add zero in, so to add zero, we lose that top number. But we're really encoding 128 things. So we could do this in that bit. So it would be legit in seven bits. Start students with some numbers. As long as we had all, all unique numbers, we could put down 89 different combinations of those numbers. And all the ones that didn't match would be error states or should not happen or can't happen states, however we wanted to treat those. Now, remember we're saying that is a minimum for the states. If I have my colors back again, go back to them. What if I encoded them this way? That's perfectly legitimate. There is more than two bits there, certainly. There's four bits to represent it. As a matter of fact, I used a particular encoding. This encoding we talked about with the ring counter. It's called a one-hot. One of the values is turned on. All the others are off in each of those pictures. But the order doesn't matter as long as one bit is on. We also could have done this using more bits over here this time. And I put one too many there, put it one here. So as long as they're all unique, they can be state names. Oops, this guy's the same as that guy, isn't he? So we didn't want to we can't do that. What do you run maybe here? They're still the same. So we got to move this one somewhere else. Let's move it to the second position here. They're all unique. 
we use six bits. Now, part of the design of a my state machine is going to be picking out how many state bits you actually want to use. And you want to do it in a way that you reduce the amount of combinational logic you actually have to do. Sometimes a simple solution like a one hot, and this is still a one hot, because only one bit at a time is on to represent those colors. But if those are the only four states we can possibly have, then uh, we've, we've, you know, we've got unique ones for that. I had trouble there getting a unique one for a few minutes because I kept producing the same ones because my algorithm was bad. Okay, so let's think about another case where we might use a state machine. And I'm going to use an informal way of drawing uh, the uh, diagram right now. What I'm going to do is I'll just use circles to represent I said a coin machine. Okay, so we're the, the great inventors of the coin collection system that works on a um, vending machine. And we'll make our vending machine and egg salad sandwiches. Egg salad sandwiches. I mean, who wouldn't go for that? Hope none of you do. You'd probably die from it. But this thing vends out egg salad sandwiches. We hope they're fresh, but our purpose was not to worry about this. Ours is to worry about the machine that takes the money. Let's assume for a second that we have a way to put the machine into a state which says we have received zero cents. And I'll leave the cents marks off everything else. And let's say that an egg salad sandwich costs 25 cents. I drew a cent sign there in spite of myself. So we walk up to the machine. It's been reset to be ready. We now enter a coin. What really are our options? We don't take pennies. We probably do take a nickel. We probably take a dime. We probably take a quarter. So the machinery, upon seeing either a nickel, dime, or quarter, logically moves us to that state. In this state, we're in the state of dime, the state of five, or nickel, the state of 25 cents or quarter. So we look over here, we notice a quarter is kind of meaningful. So while we're in this machine over here, Let's put a, a zero underneath it to indicate don't open up the vending mechanism. Don't open it up. Don't open it up. Open it up. And by the way, I'm going to circle this guy to say, and you're done. As a matter of fact, I'm going to draw a little arrow pointing at this, which is after the vending has occurred, it trips a lever which causes this clear or reset signal here to reset the state machine back to zero. Everybody see how that might work? Give me some green or red if you don't understand. Okay. Most people, I guess y'all can relate to vending out stuff. When I was in college, we had a vending machine. It was a very interesting building. The school had rented half of a medical laboratory. Yeah, the, the floors, it was a mini floored building. But you would frequently ride on the elevators, and there would be a corpse on a tray next to you, or whatever they call those things, a cart that they were taking up to one of the floors to study. And then you'd go on up to your own class and things like that. But on the very first floor, they had a vending machine. And that vending machine literally did serve egg salad sandwiches and tuna fish sandwiches. And the obvious, you know, popcorn and all the pretzels, Coke, Sprite, you know, Mountain Dew, uh, something called Big Red, which was a really, if you've never had Big Red, it's an experience. And so you'd go put your money in. And I think an egg salad back then was about a quarter, maybe less. 
15 cents maybe, but a quarter, and you'd get a sandwich out. And the sandwiches were remarkably good to be as old. And we always assumed that they probably were preserving them on the floor where they were preserving the cadavers because they no, nobody got sick. And today, the health department wouldn't even let you vend something like that unless you were in Japan. And there they let you vend anything. But they have rules, but you can pretty much buy anything out of a vending machine. I saw that we can also now, that, what's their name? There's a car company that has a vending machine that will vend you your car. Of course, there's some formality to it, but it literally serves you up your car when you put in the you know, right token at the right time. Okay, so let's continue this. This guy's happy. He got a sandwich. The guy with a nickel, the guy with a dime, have some options. One of the things is they could ask for their money back. Well, being short-sighted, we assumed nobody can do that. So we didn't give them any way to get their money back. So they're going to have to proceed ahead. We could design that in later. Make a great test question someday. Now, what can we do when we get to five? So I'm going to actually label the line to say what we did. We entered a nickel. We entered it in a dime. We entered 25 cents. Okay, so at this point, we could enter a nickel. But if we enter a nickel, are we really just in this state over here? Let me stick some little arrowheads on this so we can see which way we're moving. In case I draw some circles. So if I enter a nickel at this point, I just go here. If I enter a dime, though, I need to go to a state called 15 cents. And I still want to keep the vending machine closed. I don't want it to vend a sandwich. So if I'm at 10 cents and I enter a nickel, where would I go? Well, you should be saying to yourself, you go to the 15 cent spot. What if here I enter a dime? I'll go to a spot called 20 cents that hasn't been created yet. I still don't vend anything. This guy can't do anything because it reset the machine back to zero. If he enters anything, he's heading on his way to buying a second sandwich. This guy had one other choice he could do. He could enter a quarter. If he does, he's going to go to a state called 30 cents. The vending machine will open up and serve him a sandwich. The machine is at its end right there because it's going to trigger this to reset us back. And being the lousy designer we are, we also didn't give him back his nickel. So we're making money on this guy. So we gave him a sandwich and we kept his extra nickel. So let's assume I'm at 15 cents. What could happen? I could enter a nickel. In which case, I go to 20 cents. I could enter a dime. If I do, I get vended a sandwich. I could enter a quarter. What does that give me? 40 cents? I just draw it as a small circle because... We're keeping the change. We will vend the sandwich. We'll keep the change. Now, way up at dime up here, we left one out. You could enter a quarter at that point, right? You go to 35 cents, which we haven't seen anywhere yet. We'd vend the sandwich. We'd keep the change. So what you can see is, and I'm not going to finish up all the other possibilities. Most of these have closure by the time you add a few coins. The one that's going to take the most is you could have five nickels right before you get to a serve. But in doing this, if you notice, in each state, it didn't matter how we got there. At the point we got there, we were in that state. Now, you might say, well, what if I wanted to be able to give back the overpay they gave? Well, think of it this way. What if instead of having a single output, which means vend or don't vend, I have four more. I'm going to make them once for now just to mark them differently. The 
first one says return a nickel. The next one says return a dime. The next one says return 20 cents or two dimes. And we could save this one to be return a quarter if we ever charged more, but let's just pretend like it's not there for the moment. So if we overpay by a nickel, we would make this a one and these two a zero. So we'd return a nickel. So it would look like one, zero, zero. We wanted to return a dime, we'd return one, zero, one, zero. We'd just simply make that a separate output of this state or any state, it would tell you how much to return. It would all be in these last states, every other state would have zeros for them because you don't want to midstream return anything. 15 cents, we just turn on a nickel and a dime. Then we return 20 cents, we just return 0, 0, 001. So we could use four bits describing the outputs of this machine to handle do we vend and how much change do we actually return. And we could code this since there's only four possibilities. We could actually encode this in two bits. It's really clear to see if we say, record it in the three, three bits here. And also that way we disambiguate between a dime and trying to return two nickels, which we can't do. We can return one nickel, one dime, or two dimes. So maybe three bits is, is appropriate for that. So everybody kind of get the sense of how useful a finite state machine would be? Because we actually built the mechanism that could handle a change maker or a vending machine uh, thing. This particular one has a start state, always starts with zero and a bunch of end states, and the end states always literally vend something, but they also typically, are, well, in, the, in our machine here, they're always 25 cents or higher. And we may, if we add this addition to it, we're not going to keep their money. We might actually give them back the proper change. Now, of course, if this was a real machine, there's all sorts of things that can happen. We all put money in a machine, and it's not vended to something, and somebody shakes the heck out of the machine. And, you know, we, it can cause problems with the electronics. It is actually, there are several people a year killed by vending machines falling over on them. They don't realize how heavy they are. And they, you know, a little vending rage, like road rage. They shake the thing and they get it off balance. And the things are, some of them are pretty much, you know, they're, they're intended to be bottom heavy. But if you ever pass their center of gravity, that thing will just fall forward. And uh, we've all seen the case where, the machine doesn't have proper change to return to us. So it just returns the coin we just put in. Again, that would be some changes to the output of each state. But we'd have to be able to really handle that in real life because if we couldn't, then we would wind up keeping money and that typically makes people mad. You know, unless we called it the egomatic cheating machine. Make it a gambling machine. You put your money in and bet on whether you'll get an egg salad sandwich out. Okay, so those are some practical uses. Uh, if you've taken discrete math or if you've taken the uh, data structures in the spring, we might have talked about regular expressions. Regular expressions are actually implemented using a finite state machine, usually called an automaton in that case. But they're very typically simply a software realization of something we could also build in hardware quite easily. Now, some facts to know and tell. Let's get some facts to know and tell here so that we can talk about our um, finite state machines. First of all, easier to see if it's higher. There are two main types. One is called a Moore machine, and the other is called a Mealy. It's M E A L Y, Mealy machine. We are going to focus on the Moore machine, not the Mealy machine. And there's good reason in terms of hardware implementation we might choose to do so. We'll need to look kind of at the picture of one to really understand it, but there's some components 
that we need to think about in a machine. One of the things is there is the current state. Let's just write it that way. Actually, let's write state and say there's two types. There's current state and there's next state. And we need some way in our machine, knowing the current state and possibly the inputs, we need to determine what the next state is. Now, I mentioned the word input. Your machine may have 0 through, I'm going to say M because we're going to use N somewhere else. Inputs. So it may have none. It may have many. The number of inputs does not in any way have to relate to the number of state bits we're using. State bits are represented 0 through N bits. We know what the minimum is, right? And that's our thing of power two. The inputs, I'll put an S on it, even though it may be zero or one, could be a different number of them. Now, additionally, we're going to produce some outputs. We typically will not have zero outputs because then you don't know what the state machine is doing. So, it's kind of like write-only memory. If you had memory that you could write to, but you could never read back, it doesn't sound. And it turns out later, I will we'll tell you there is a use for it. But uh, just with what we know now, there's not really a good use for it. So, how many outputs? Do I need the same as the number of inputs? Well, no. But I will probably have one through M N N O. Let's put O. Let's put yeah, one through O for output. So I'll probably have at least one. Very often, the number of outputs is the number. Let me just put this. I'll just say often O equals N. So sometimes the number of outputs will equal the number of state bits, and that was the reason you picked that number of state bits, was because it exactly mapped to the number of outputs you need. For example, we did a counter where we were counting from the outside in. We named them different state names because we had two outputs that were the same. But if all the outputs are unique, you might get better logic for creating them by simply making them be equal to the state bits. Because then you don't have any combinational logic sitting between the state name and the actual outputs. Very often, though, you're going to have more states than essential outputs or vice versa. And they did simply don't map to be the same. So we can think of it being flexible there. But we probably will not have less than one in a state machine. Somebody needs to be looking at at least an output, even if it's only a state bit. Now, what are the main differences between a more and a melee? Well, we need to highlight that. But in particular, there are two places where we're going to have differences. One is, I shouldn't say between, in front of state bits is some combinational logic. And often, what it's doing is it's computing what the next state is in terms of the current state and the inputs. So you'll notice there's some combinational logic in front of the state bits. Now, in front of the outputs, There's combinational logic. It computes the outputs in terms of now more machine, the current state, Mealy machine, current state. And the inputs. We have one difference right there between a more and a melee. 
The melee can change its outputs without changing state. And that's kind of scratch your head and say, hmm, I can think of some reasons why that might not be good. And particularly when we talk about other things later, you'll see why it definitely is, in terms of our world with what we know, it's not a really good thing. A saving grace, though, is all melees can be turned into mores with additional logic. So if we have a melee machine, we want to really design it as a more. We may have to make a more complicated machine, but the characteristics of a more machine are such that we really would like for it to be one. So that's some information we need to know. Now, very importantly, state bits State bit will be implemented in terms of a flip flop. I may have put a hyphen, may have put a space. So we have combinational logic in front of some flip flops, in front of some combinational logic. Now, number of flip flops necessary. Equals. So in our machine, when we talk about the state register, what we're talking about is a bunch of flip-flops next to each other, which are currently showing us the current state. The current state is derived from the next state, which is computed from their inputs. Now, while we can build a state machine out of any edge-triggered flip-flop, most and probably all the ones we do in here, we'll use AK, D, or T flip flops. And you go, well, I know what a JK is. I know what a D is. Uh, what's a T? Well, let's talk about a T for a second. First of all, let's do a JK flip-flop here. So it's J and K producing Q. You get no change. Actually, we don't use J and K. In here, J is called... I mean, actually, I'll leave J and K because it'll make more sense this way, but... J is actually the set button. And K is the reset. So if set is a zero and reset is a zero, which happen to be J and K, we get no change. If we say reset, Q becomes a zero. If we say set, Q becomes a one. If we say both of them to one, remember we that's what we had done is we took J and K and we taken the set and reset, tied them together to make them a D, and then when we split the D back apart, we named it J and K because we added this fourth function, which added toggle. But JK has the ability to give us good condition states. We could do it with an RS latch that had a clock, an edge-triggered clock, but you're not going to find those typically, even though we'll look at the table for it and everything to see how we might do it. Well, the engineers got a hold of a JK, and they said, you know what? In your application, you never use those two states. You either want it to toggle or you want it to not toggle. Why don't we tie J and K together and call them T and have it produce a Q, where T could be a zero, in which case there's no change, 
or t could be a one, in which case you get a toggle. So this is the fourth type of flip-flop. Now, why didn't I tell you before? Because you can't buy these direct, well, you can, but you can't buy these in the uh, TTL family, where you can buy JKs and Ds. But the T is something you might find you know, on an integrated circuit, where you're building this hardware inside of the integrated circuit. So I need to introduce it to you, because one of the next coming upcoming lessons is going to be about how you would use an, a field programmable gate array in order to do that. And that's an integrated circuit that you program the innards of. And it might be able to have T flip-flops programmed. And so we need to know about that. So most of the state bits we have will use either JK, D, Ts, or flip-flops. So I have a picture which we can look at, which will kind of review what we just said. Now, uh, that just is going to bring out white for me. And as I recall, this thing is way too sensitive. Yeah. So I can make it too big for the screen, and we'll miss what's on it. But we can look at the two halves. I'm going to divide things into two parts here to start with. Below that line is the Mealy machine. I'm going to talk about it a couple times while we're doing our thing here. But in most cases, we're not going to do much consideration of it. We'll consider it when we talk about how we diagram them. But other than that, we'll, we'll not worry about it. There's several parts to this. There's an input section. There's some combinational logic. This is the Moore machine. Moore is the one we care about. Combinational logic's purpose is to set the inputs of our flip-flops that are in here. And there's one flip-flop per state bit. Notice they're all positive going clocks, except if we use JK, even though this says it's positive going, we know it really happens on a falling clock. So if we use JK, it's up to us to make the timing diagram right. But these would be, each of these, consider these each to be a separate flip-flop. This could be the D input of each one. This could be the T input of some T flip-flops. This could be J and K, J and K, J and K, J and K, where there are two arrows for each of the one arrow here. And the, what their values are are computed based on this input, as well as whatever the state register currently holds. So we're computing next state based on the current value, the current state, and the current inputs. Whatever's sitting here is the current state, right in here. The current state then gets decoded by some combinational logic to produce some number of outputs. And you'll notice in their picture here, they used I for the number of inputs. They didn't state it here, but they're using J for the number of uh, state bits and K for the number of outputs. So they could be unique. Remember, there may be no inputs, but there may be one output. The combinational logic here may be just simply a buffer that takes one output or two outputs or three outputs and simply makes the current state be the output. We we'll use a box here to indicate that that's probably going to happen. You wouldn't typically hook your LED directly to the state register. You put a buffer or something in here, which would be combinational logic, even though the logic is simply, you know, y equals 1, or actually y equals s1, in this case, state 1. Now, what are the differences between these two? Well, in the Moore machine, the outputs are a function solely of the current state. See that? Only the current state is driven into this. However, on a Mealy machine, not only are the outputs using the current state, but this one set of combinational logic is not only generating the next state, it's generating the current outputs. That means the moment an input changes, the output changes immediately. Perhaps. I mean, it might be exactly the same output, but theoretically it changes. So the number of inputs are conditioned by what is the current state and what is the current value of the inputs. The instant an input changes, propagation delay later, the output changes. It's not synchronized with the state changes. Up here, 
outputs change synchronously with the state changes. This is a very important thing to do because then we always know that the outputs match exactly the state we're in. In this case, we can have multiple outputs in a, in a particular state. That to us is not a particularly good thing. It can make for smaller machines if you know what you're doing and how to design them. But the signals here are truly asynchronous, meaning that we don't know when these are going to change. We just know the states change on a clock. In the picture up here, we're always synchronous because the outputs always change relative to that clock. Everybody see the difference? I'll draw a big X here. Other than showing you how we would draw one, I'm not going to spend any time nor test you on the, this. I may ask you the differences, but I'm not going to make you design one. Probably have to design one of these, but they're easy. As you can tell, that we've really not done anything new tonight. We've talked about piecing together what we already know. So as long as you've been keeping good notes and keeping up with the class, this is like old hat to you. Oh, yeah, we're hooking the stuff up now. Okay. So let us now actually talk about how we would draw one. Um, I'll close this so it's not in my way. I'll keep this around because I might need it later. So let's assume we wanted to draw a counter. And in this case, we're going to do the count we proposed earlier. We want our output to start at 0, progress to 1, then progress to two 1s, and then finally to a 1, 0. So it's producing something called gray code. Then A. Gray code is the same thing we were doing and seeing in a Carnot map, which is where you have the first two items, then you skip the third, go to the fourth, and then come back to the third. The reason being, between each of these, I have a single bit change to get the next output. 0, 0 goes to 0, 1, goes to 1, 1, goes to 1, 0, goes to 0, 0. So in each case, only one bit changed. Now, I'm going to call those outputs. This is output 1. This is output 0. Now, I could have made these be the state names and wired them together so we just went in this pattern. But just for illustrative purposes now, I'll assume that we have our state names, which are S1, and S0 named in binary count order. And this is purely just arbitrary. You wonder why my writing was so bad there. I was dodging my cat's back leg. She had laid it on top of my paper. OK, so. How would we draw a picture of this? We, we got the state table. That's good. Let's draw a picture. We want to take a state. A state's represented by a circle. I'm going to arrange them in a circle. And I'm going to draw arrows between them to indicate what the flow of state is going to be. Now, I'm going to label each box or circle with the state name 00, zero goes to zero, 01, goes to 10. Zero. I'm sorry, I want, yeah, I want state names here. That's right. Goes to 11. One, one. Now, if it's a more machine, it's a more machine. I'm going to put my outputs below a line. Looks like the Michelin man, right? I put my outputs down below the line. It could be a different number.
Now, if there had been inputs, the input values would have been put on the arrows. For example, I have a path from here to there if the value of the input is a 1. And maybe I have a path from here to here if the value is 0. Going out of any particular state, all of the possibilities have to be accounted for. If it could be either, and I have an input, I would put a 0, a comma, in the input. So Z, on either 0 or 1, go here. If there are no inputs, I don't have anything labeled. Now, if it were a mealy machine, ignore the line, ignore the numbers below the line. I would only write the state name inside the state. So I'd write it like 0, 0. And if it were a mealy machine, we would be going to the next state. I would write the outputs after a slash, after the inputs. So I would put an x slash, and in this case, I'm going to 0, 1. So 0, 1 is my output. So the outputs appear after a slash, after the input. If there is no input, just use an x. If there are multiple inputs, like a 0 doing one thing and a 1 doing the same thing, I put a comma, just like I did in the other thing, a 1, a slash, and then maybe it goes to the same value. But the maybe actually, maybe in this case, it goes to a different place. Because remember, this is a melee. We change when the input changes, not when the state changes. So we're not going to worry about those and having to write or draw them. Just that's a different notation in case you run into one somewhere. We want it in a more form like this. And in our case right here, we have a very simple diagram. It tells us what to do. What we don't know is when we turn it on, where is it going to be? Well, hardware-wise, we don't know. But we'll almost always supply a signal and not always draw it, which is either called reset, RST, or clear, CLR, which says this is where we go. So we arrange so when we turn the machine on, we assert this signal. Now we're currently in state zero. If I were to not tell you what the start state was, and you had a state named zero, make the assumption that is the start state. So in this picture here, we'll assume that to be the start state. If a different one was the start state, I might circle it. Second circle means start state or end state. In a loop, it doesn't mean much. But also, in case if I were to draw an arrow here, and say this is where preset goes, PR or set, that wouldn't tell you what the start state was. It would just tell you where you would wind up with preset. If, however, I've marked this as uh, clear, you'd know that the start state was this bottom circle. Right now, no marks. This is the start state. So what would we see? We see the states changing from 0, 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 0 to 1, 1. We see the outputs changing from 0, 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 1 to 1, 0 back to 0. And that would just go on forever. Every clock tick. Now, the clocks don't have to tick continuously. The first clock might tick, and then 30 minutes later, the next clock change it to the next state. Remember, these could be lots of things. I entered the car wash. I am in the first station, so we've turned on the wash me bit. We've turned on the wash me, but we've also turned on the scrub. We turned on the scrub, but turned off the wash. To, you know, we maybe have a rinse after that. So we could control the outputs. This could be the haunted house, right? Nothing happens when the guy walks in. We make the skeleton jump, jump out of the box. Here we have him still out, but the guy in the coffin sets up. Here the skeleton goes away, but the guy's still sitting up. They go back into their respective places so that you've moved past those stations inside the haunted house. Could be notes, maybe we're playing bells and we want to have the C note play. We want to have the C and the G note at the same time. We want to leave only the G. We want nothing to play. Whatever we could control could be those outputs. And in hardware, that's everything. So uh, we can think of, as we design, what states we need. In this case, we had the same number of inputs as outputs, so it's less interesting. But let's move to the kind of here, what would we do next if we were asked to design this as a circuit. Okay, 
we have to go back to our truth tables here. We have to do a little more work. So I'm going to rewrite the truth table. Let me shrink this down a little bit and stretch it out so I've got more working space. And try to use the big pencil. Okay, so we said we have state one and we have state zero. We always list these in binary order, no matter how they appear in the chart. Raul, how many flip-flops is this design going to have? Four. Anybody want to, Gabriel, you want to take a shot at it and see if you come up with a different number? Ryan, would you like to come up with a number? I don't have a guess for this one. Um, that's all right. Sandy? Oh, I'm not sure. Okay, well, let's go back to our notes. You all should have some notes. Yeah, it's two. So we know from the fact we have two state bets, we're going to have two, a flip-flop for each state bet. Okay, so we need to continue our truth table over here. I'm going to draw a dividing line for now. Not that it means we're going to outputs, but we're going to some other piece of data we need to consider. This is the current state. What should the next state Hey, well, they have the same name. Write the word next over it. So we know what those two columns represent, and they'll be kind of together. We start at 0, 0, right? What's the next state after 0, 0 in our picture? 0, 1. 0, 1 goes where? Goes to 1, 0. One zero goes to one one. One one goes to zero zero. Okay, so far even I could do that one. Nothing nothing big and sophisticated going on yet. Now, the next thing we need to consider is what type of flip flop we're going to use. And let's say that the teacher told us. We need to use T flip-flops. We know the truth table for a T flip-flop over here. And we know we have a T and we have its output Q. T can either be a zero or it can be a one. If it's a zero, nothing changes. If it's a one, Q becomes toggled. Okay. So what we're basically saying here is if I'm currently a zero and my next state is a zero, there's really no change between those two bits, is there? So the T1 bit is the input to the first. So if I'm, well, of course, have a T2 or a T0 over here also. But I would set my T bit to a zero to make that happen before the clock, right? If I'm here and I set my T to zero, I will get a zero on that bit after the clock. In this case, I have a zero, but I want a one. That means I need a toggle, doesn't it? Okay, to toggle, I have to set my T-bit to a 1 back here. Here, it's the same. So I don't want to do anything. 
And here it toggles from a 1 to a 0. How about the other bit? 0 goes to 1. That sounds like a toggle to me. 1 goes to 0. That sounds like a toggle to me. 0 goes to 1. That sounds like a toggle to me. 1 goes to 0. Sounds like a toggle to me. Okay. We then can take and do a Carnell map for T1. They're in terms of these two variables. So this is not S1. This is S1. This is not S0. This is S0. Let's fill it in. 0, 1, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, 1. So it looks like that's going to be something useful in a second. Let's do a kind of map for the second column. So just remembering, this is the stuff for T1 up here. This is the stuff for T2 down here. Again, the thing would be labeled the same, not S1, S1, not S0, S0, 1, 1, 1, 1. That sounds pretty good. Looks like I can circle everything in there. Our dream has happened. So, let's write the equation. The equation for T1 is equal to, it looks like state 0. T2 looks like it's equal to a 1. So no matter what, it's always equal to uh, a 1. We could... If we wanted to, for purposes of building this thing, we could say that it also is equal to you know not S1 or S1. Now remember we had somewhere a, a statement that said A or A, not A, always equaled 1. So we could, we could generate it if we didn't want to use a buffer or we wanted to build NAND gates out of it. But let's think about what we have to do. Let's take our two flip-flops, flipper floppers. Let's draw the schematic diagram for them. Now, we've not seen a T, but I'm sure we can deduce what it must be. We'll make this be the T1 bit. I'm sorry, not T1. This is the state one flip-flop. It's got T coming in. It's got a clock. I'm not going to uh, label it. We won't worry about resets and clears and all that, but we know we have two, a Q and a not Q. Let's call our outputs. This guy is actually Q. This guy is actually not Q. But in terms of what we care about, let's call them state one and not state one. And then we're going to have a second flip-flop that looks like, let's see if I can be an advanced paint user here. Here it is. Be proud of me here if I get this to work. Wow. You didn't know your teacher was educated, did you? Okay, so this is going to be the S2 flip-flop down here. I'm sorry, S0 flip-flop. Its outputs will be not S0 and S0. Of course, this input up here is T1, and this one is T0. We have equations for these, right? We said that T1 needs to be hooked to S0. So basically, we can run a wire from there back to T1. We said T0 needs to be hooked over here to plus 5 volts. Now, that makes the states available. So we're actually looking at the state by combining state 1 with 
is state zero. Of course, we have its inverse is not state one and not state zero. So the other piece that's missing from this is we need to figure out what the truth table is for our outputs. This is output one. This is output zero. It's always based on the current state. When we're in zero, zero, the output needs to be zero, zero. When we're in zero, one, output needs to be zero, one. We're in one, zero, output needs to be one, one. When we're in one, one, the output needs to be one, zero. So it sounds like we need a couple more Carnell maps. Make room for them here. We'll put them next to the two that are already here. Matter of fact, you know what? Let's uh, get rid of those and write it in up here. We know this was T1. This was T0. So we need two more Carnell maps. Well, what should I label this one? What am I going to write up here? It's not. It's not T one. Um, it should be T zero. T zero down here. Oh no, 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 sorry. Um, what are we getting ready to do? Which equations are we getting ready to minimize? These so two columns here, right? Zero. Yeah, yeah. Would it be O one? O one. This guy is O zero. That's O zero. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and so he's going to be again not S one. S one. Not S zero. S zero. Such a wonderful zero. Not S one. That cat keeps kicking me. We'll fill it in. Zero, zero, one, one. Zero, zero, one, one. Zero, one, one, zero. Zero, one, one, zero. Equation for the top one. O1 is equal to S1. O0 is equal to something that can't be reduced. It turns out to be an exclusive or. And so it would be not S1, S0, or S1, not S0. So we can hook this up. Here's our outputs over here. Let, let's assume for a second that uh, we're hooking them up to LEDs. I'll hook them in the wrong direction to make them turn on when there's a 1. And we assume we got transistors and stuff in here, but we I know we don't. So O1, this is the guy on top. He's output 1, mostly related with S1, right? And output 0 down here. Where do we hook this guy up? Well, he goes directly to S1. Oh, he's done. Other end goes to ground. We probably have a resistor or a transistor or something. This guy has to hook up to multiple signals. So he's hooked up to two things anded together. The result or together. And I'm just going to use them as that I'll leave it to you to be able to uh, turn those into NAND gates. And these wires here, this guy hooks up to not S1. This guy hooks up to S0. I'm not going to draw the wires over there. It'd be crowded. We could draw a bus that described it. This guy draws S1, and he's not S0 here. So if we were doing the bus, what we could do is, in addition to what we have here, we could just draw our signals. We don't need the inverters now because we could just label the lines S1, not S1, 
S0, not S0, because we already have those signals available. Just assume that these guys by name are connected to those lines. And we can just pull the wires across if we wanted to show that. But just naming them the right thing in most wiring diagrams would be satisfactory. Once we did that, turn this on, these lights would blink following the pattern along the bottom here. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. I'm sorry, 1, 1, 1, 0. They follow the bottom outputs. And we've completely built this as a state machine. Now, at this point, your eyes may be rolling around in your head a little bit because that's a lot of work. I'd literally fill all the chalkboards in the classroom when we're working on these and we're face to face. So I know that this is a lot to absorb. But it nevertheless is something that you need to know and you are prepared to know it if you've been keeping up. You know, if you've been uh, staying on top of the material you're supposed to be doing and if you go all the way back to day one, if you memorized your power as a two and you did X and you did Y, all those things, then uh, you're prepared for this. Okay, let's do another one of these. Anybody have any questions before I raise this? Minor point of clarification. You have T2 listed. Did you mean T0? Oops, T0. Good, thank you. When you do these and you look at your notes later, double check me. I'm not working with notes. So when I'm doing these things, I'm doing them the same as you would be doing them. And so it's not I have the answers written down somewhere. So if I put something wrong down and you copy it down, make sure you understand why you put it down. And when you go through them later and just correct any mistakes I made, I probably won't remember I made them. And I don't save my uh, diagrams or anything because I use the uh, different diagram in a different class. Okay, let's do another one of these. I think we're in good shape for that. Um, I know I can just erase that, but it's easier on my thinking down here. Just open another one. Okay, let's assume in this case, we're going to do something simpler. And it'll have a couple of extra little things to think about. I'm going to create three states. I know Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Ryan, tell me how many uh, state bits I'm going to need. Minimum. I'm still a bit lost. I apologize. Okay, Joseph. Um, two. You sure? You think so? Oh uh, wait. Um. Don't change your. Oh, answer. state base. No, sorry. You, uh, no, you're gonna need four. Uh, go with two. Yeah, I should go with two. Yeah, I go with two. Okay. Yeah, two. And the reason is, is because we have less than four things to represent. You can count to four, you know, zero through three. You can count four items in two bits. We got three items. So let's name our states. One, 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 zero. Could I name another one, one, one? Would there be confusion if I did that, Kyle? I lose Kyle. He's probably outside looking to see if there's a lunar eclipse tonight. Okay, and make this one be zero one. What is it going to happen if we get in state zero zero? Well, we'll have an error. An invalid state. We'll make the assumption that we have controlled our system well enough that we're handling it without putting it to clutter up this picture. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that state if I get a zero on my input. 
I'm going to stay in the same state if I get a 1. In this particular state, if I get a 1, I'm going to go back here. If I get to get a 0, I'm going to go over here. This guy is going to go here. If he gets a 1, and he's going to stay in his own state if he gets a zero. Now, we have no idea why he wants to do that. But what we do know is that there are three outputs. And they need to have those values if you're in those states. Draw a little line here. So we have inputs. We always go back and check to make sure that all of the coming out, all of the numbers are represented, 0 and 1. So there's always two arrows out. And if there's one arrow, we repeat a value. I'm going to write that a little bigger so it's easier for me to see. OK, so Gabriel. If I'm in state 1, 0, and I get a 1, what's the next state? OK. Ethan, if I'm in state 0, 1, and I get a 0, what state am I going to be in? Uh, 0, 1, 0. Well, states are only two bits long. Anybody want to help him out? Uh, you'd be in, you would stay in state zero one. Oh, good. You guys all got it right. That's good. Yeah, you'd stay in the same state because zero leads us back to it. So inputs are on the edges. These are called edges, by the way, if I didn't use that word. These are sometimes called nodes, but they're, they're really states. This is a state and an edge. Inside here, the top thing is the state bits or the state register bits. Below the line are the outputs. This is what we want to produce as output if we're in that state. So how many flip-flops am I going to need in order to do this? Mr. Bathia. Um, looks like five. Anybody want to help him out? Or six. Three. Two. Or two. Two. I, go, I think I go with two, since there's two state bets. Oh, oh okay. yeah, yeah. So we have state bets. Let's assume that we were told we need to use JK flip-flops. We're only told that. We assume they're MS type. We assume they're going to operate on the falling edge. But that doesn't really matter. That's just if we draw a timing diagram, we'll see that. We're going to have two flip-flops, both of them JK. We're going to call the states, the two bits, state 1 and state 0. In our truth table, we will number them. However, since we go to a different place depending on the input, we're going to include the input, which is I0, as part of the current state's combinational logic. So it could be a 0 while we're in state 0, or it could be a 1. Could be a 1 here, a 0 there, a 0, 1 again. But we have a 1 on the input, 1, 0 with a 0, 1, 0 with a 1, 1, 1 with a 0, 1, 1 with a 1. Now, I separated it here, but if it'll let me, I'll just erase that line because it really now becomes part of the number we're going to care about when we do Carnot reduction. 
all three of those condition what the next state is going to be. If you remember back from the original diagram, which I don't think I still have open. It's this guy. You notice here, inputs and the current state are what's feeding this combination of logic out front here. So they're part of what we have to consider if we're going to take this and make you know, Boolean reduction of some combinational logic. But then we have the next state to deal with. So next, actually that's a little too messy for my taste. A little higher. The next state will only be the state bits. State one and state zero. We call this next state. And we have to look and we have to fill it in. If we're in state zero and we have a zero, where do we go? Well, if there is no state zero. So the next state for both of these is don't care. We don't know what should happen. We're just going to say we don't care. However, if we're in zero one, which is over here, and we get a zero, we stay in zero one. From zero one and we get a one, we go to one one. We're in one zero, which is down here. We get a zero, we go to zero one. If we're in one zero and we get a one, we go back to one one. In one one, we get a zero, we go to one zero. And in one one, if the input's a one, we get a back to one one. So now we know this logic needs to drive these outputs. This is like having two truth tables. But this is not outputs. This is simply getting us ready now to prepare for our flip-flops. We have two flip-flops. So I'll give them some places to live. But they have two inputs each. So this is J1, K1. This is J0. This is K0. And what we need to do is we need to say, if we're currently at a 0, well, let's pick one that has a value. If we're currently at a 0 and we want a 1, what values do J and K have to be if we're using only the S1 column? Well, J and K1 are going to combine that. What values J have to have? What value does K have to have? And then when we get to the other bit, we have to do what does the uh, J and 0 bits do? Well, we could do that, but it would be easier if we had a reference to help us do that. And the way we do that is we create something called an excitation table. I know, don't get excited. An excitation table. And the excitation table basically takes the truth table for a JK or a D or a T or an RS and turns it inside out on itself. It takes a lot of work to get it done. So Fortunately for us, one of my previous students from years gone by did all the work for us. A guy named Perry LaFrance. Way back in 2004, on the 5th of October, which is about the same time as us, in COS 231, created for us the excitation tables for each of the truth tables that we are aware of. We will think about the RS for a second, but we won't ever use one. And then we'll just make the assumption that these were derived correctly. We already kind of derived this one by thinking about it. We said if we 
want it to be off and it's already off. Well, I want it to be off and it's already off. Don't toggle. If we want it on and we want to keep it on. Don't toggle. If we want it to switch, toggle. So a while ago, we verbally were talking about the TX citation table without seeing one. But if you think about it here, this is the same sort of thing going on. If Q is currently a zero, and we want it to remain a zero, which is here, what values do S and R have to be? Well, S needs to be a zero, but it doesn't matter what R is, because both those re rows yield the same effect. Q started as a zero and wound up a zero. So if we grab both those rows, we see that S has to be a zero, but it doesn't matter what R is. The same thing is true of the next guy, zero, one. If it's at zero now, we want it to go to a one. So it's at zero now, we want it to go to a one. That's this row in the table. And it's one of these two rows down here that we're not going to consider. So the only value we need is one and zero, one and zero. So he went to all the trouble for us of turning all these inside out. So the one we care about right now is the JK excitation table. We want to use this guy right down here and let it tell us what to do. So let me uh, see if I can get it on the screen at the same time we have our truth table there. I'll do kind of a big shrinky dink and just scroll over for the second. Okay, we're only looking at S1, S1. So it's going from zero to we don't care. I'll do that one for you. And the answer to that is don't care, don't care. Zero to X. Again, don't care, don't care. Now that's not in the table anywhere because this is a special case of where we didn't care where we landed and that's not one of the cases here. But now we have one. We want to go from zero to zero. What should J and K be? They should be a zero and an X. We want to go from zero to one. Zero to one. There should be a one and an X. I'm going to go from one to zero. One to zero is an X and a one. We want to go from 1 to 1, which is an X and a 0. We want to go from 1 to 1 and 1 to 1, but we already saw those are all X and zeros. Now we have to do it for the other state bit. Again, these will be don't care states. We want to go from 1 to 1. That's X and zero. One to one, that's an X and zero again. We want to go from zero to one, which is a one and an X. We want to go from zero to one, to one and an X. We want to go from one to zero, which is X and a one. And finally, we want to go from a 1 to a 1, which is an X and a 0. Now, you guys check what I just did, because literally I did it when you did it, and I don't have the answer written down. Make sure I got all the things copied correctly. And somebody tell me if I didn't. So I have the excitation table. Uh, I believe it's on Blackboard, and it's probably there already under Lessons, so that you can have it to look at or print out or keep with you if you're having a test or something. Because this is, you don't want to have to derive this and work a problem in the same session. Okay, so we can, should be able to write equations now. And you're getting a trend here. You're always going to be writing the equations for the flip-flops and for the outputs. So we got a J1, K1, 
neat equations. And we're going to have a J0 and a K0 needing a question, equation, because those are the two flip-flops we have. There's four inputs, but two flip-flops. We don't care about I now because I has already taken care of getting us to the right place. So we got eight items we're going to need to do a Carnell map, you know, of the eight variety here. So we're really going to need four of those. Let me go ahead and draw them. This is where I need some sort of a cookie cutter template. You can use the shapes op option. I know, but the problem with that is you've got to keep clicking buttons to keep changing shapes. Yes, you can. Okay, now I'm going to label the first one, but not the other three because they'll have the same labels. What are the What is the name of this box right here? Who wants to tell me that? Somebody up on your mic and tell me. Would it be S1? No, no sorry, not S1, uh, J1. Well, we know this table right here is going to be the table we're going to use for J1. We're going to use this one for K1. I'm going to use this one for J0 and this one for K0. The first one is going to use the data in this column to try to reduce it so we can calculate J1. What are the names of the inputs that generate that column? Over here. The top left is the inverse of all of those, right? The row has a single name of not S1. So this would be S1. The columns have the second two, which is not S0, not I0. So knowing our pattern here, because this again is gray code, this is not S0, I0, S0, I0, and S0, not I0. And those are the same labels on all four of these. So we can copy it in. X, X, zero, one. X, X, zero, one. One, zero, zero. Oh, I'm sorry. X, 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 X. X, 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 X. We'll come back and reduce it in a minute. The K column. Four X's followed by a one and some zeros. Third column, four X's, followed by one, one X, X. Last column, X, X, O, O, X, X, one, O. Okay, reducing this guy. Looks like the best you can do with him is to grab those four. There doesn't seem to be anything better than that. I mean, we could grab another group, but it wouldn't add any real ones. It would only add don't cares. So we can grab that box. This guy looks like the best we can do with him is grab those two. This guy, we can grab all of them. And this guy, although those four look tempting, the best we can do is to grab those two right there. Okay, did I see any mistakes I made when I transferred that data or anything with my groupings? Okay. Well, let's write out the equations. Why don't you yourself, just on a little piece of paper off to the side, try to write out the four equation answers. Using And remember, you have to look at this and then look at the labels up there. I don't want to write all those labels again.
you should be able to do them rather quickly because I mean this is you know third week of class we were doing this okay Vinod, do you want to tell me what the uh, j1 equation is is it not s1 s0 i i0 be these be right here are these four right here? Zachary, what is the equation for that box right there? Um, would it be uh, I don't know. Some in Blamo? Pilar? Anybody want to volunteer an answer for what the first equation is? Uh, input zero. I zero. Yeah, would it just be I zero? That's what I'm going to put. And the reason we know that is because in this box, S1 changes. In this box, S0 changes, but I doesn't. Okay, let's go over to K1. Um, Santhi, what's, what's the equation for this, for the K1? Not S0, not I0. what she said. Does anybody disagree with that? Would it just be I, not I0? Well, let's think about that for a second. If it were not I0, that means it has to be in this column over here and that column over there. And it also has to include not S0 in her case. So if we just, just did, what was the one you said, not I0? Yeah. Not I0 would be only the place where it's I0 by itself, which means this guy and that guy taken together. And there's nothing, there's no reason to make this a one with this because we can only compare it in, in a box. So these two naturally need to be compared. And in this box, we see that S0 does not have a positive version. S1 changes, but... That, that entire column is labeled as not S0, not I0. So this is the correct answer. Okay, let's look down here now at J2 or J0. I'm going to call it J2. I think the rest of my life here. I'm going to do that one. One. Hey, I like that. Okay, we got one more to go. Uh, Roshana, tell me what K0's formula is. Maybe this picture here. Would it be S1, S0, and not I0? S1 and not I0 is what you said? Uh, yeah. Right, right so not S0 and also not I0. Not S0 and not I0? Zero. I'm getting too many numbers and things down here now. Give me a single a single equation here. What 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 do you think it is? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, well let's let's think about it because a lot of people are having some trouble with this and you shouldn't be. That o row is owned by S1, right? Mm -hmm. We know S1 is gonna be of its name. This column and that column, which are the two we're interested in, are both owned by not I0. So 
So if we're in this column, we have to be I0 and I0 for that. And here we have to be S1, so it only can be those two terms. Okay. If you think about them, if we were to take those two squares here, which would be this guy and this guy. There can't be any S, not S0 in it, or S0, because that changes between the two squares. And we know it has to be S1 because it's in that row. It can't be not S1 because it's simply just not in that row. So the answer to that would be, what did we say that it was? Not, it's uh, S1, not I0. And that would take care of being the four equations on an, an answer for this. But we're not done. We still have the most important part to do, which is the fact that all of this stuff was based on our table. And where did I file that away? I still have that somewhere. Oh, it was, it was our table here, yeah. Which we said we we're going to be producing some sort of outputs. And for each state, we have three outputs. So we can't really use this truth table directly because we have I as one of the inputs. So what we need is we need another table, which is just the state bits, which means there can only be four combinations of those. We had, I believe it was three output bits. So in state zero, what is the output? We have output two, output one, output zero, all of which we're going to have to do a Carnot map for. In state zero, what should these be? Anybody want to volunteer an answer? Uh, would they be don't care? That's what I'm putting. Because there is no state zero. OK, in state. 0, 1, which is the state over here, the output should be 1, 0, 1. In state 1, 0, down here, it should be 0, 1, 0. In state 1, 1, it should be 0, 0, 1. So if this were on a test, there's four more answers, right? Or three more answers, actually. We have our first four, which is what J1, J, K1, J0, K0. Now we have to also get the equations for O2, O1, and O0. So we need four Carnot, or three Carnot maps, one for each of them. And we're going to label the edges, just I'll label, well, this is, there are so few here, I'll just label them all. Not S1, S1, not S1, S1, not S1, S1, and not S0, S0, not S0, S0. Not S0, S0. Now go ahead and take a shot at getting the right answer there before we do it together and see if you would have gotten the right answer. It's on a piece of paper off to the side. So a question about this would be, it might give you the state table, might give you the uh, diagram, might give you a problem, the word problem that is obvious what the state diagram has to look like. Uh, and you'd be asked to give this, in this case, seven equations that describe the problem you know, using a more state machine. Now, inside an integrated circuit, we might decide not to do the Carnot reduction, and instead of using NAND gates, use multiplexers to generate the logic. But we're not there yet. We're still using NAND gates. So let's write these in, X100, X O one O and X one O one. Okay, check my work, make sure I did the right thing. 
and correct me if I didn't. So that group of two is pretty tempting. That group of two is pretty tempting. That group of two, and then we'll make the x a zero in that box. So now we know O2 is equal to, this is the O2 map. This is O1. This is O0. We know this is not S1. We know the O1 guy is equal to not S0. And finally, we know the O sub 0 guy is equal to S0. So if we took these four equations, I know three equations and these four equations. And on a test, we package them between those two angle brackets at the beginning. You know, we'd say something like J1 equal I0 space K1 equals. We have to be typing it would be not S0, not I0. And we do that and, that, and that would be where your answer would live. The question would have been over here, of course. The thing knows how to grade stuff that's between angle brackets. So don't ever write an angle bracket anywhere else. Otherwise, you'll have to be hand graded. And I always count everything wrong when I'm hand grading. OK. Any questions? Uh, this is just sort of an off-topic question. But on the test, uh, we're going if there's multiple parts to an answer, we're going to be separating those parts of space in those angle brackets? Yes. OK. OK, anybody else have any questions about this particular problem? A lot of work, but see, we have all our documentation. If we made a mistake, we can go back. We also, if we were doing this for real, would probably explore different values for the states. We would see if when we were done, we came up with better equations. These are pretty darn good. But maybe we would come up with one that was a, maybe more of these something equals one type of values. Now, I probably haven't meant, did I mention I might have or might not have been here? If I draw a state like this and I give it a name, but I give it no outputs, that implies that the outputs are exactly the same as the inputs unless I tell you otherwise. So this is an abbreviation for having written this. So if all the states match their outputs, I typically won't put the last part on. I'll just simply put it in there and you know that's not only the name. Because if you don't have outputs, the state machine has no value. It can be clicking away, but if it doesn't tell somebody what state it's in occasionally or produce some outputs, it isn't useful. So sometimes we design it so that the actual state bits are the meaningful data. Often, if the, and always, if the number of them is different, we have to generate you know, something like this. So we did a JK, we did a T. We obviously could do one with RS, but in real life, you're never going to do a state machine using one. So even though it's in the excitation table, we don't have to particularly um, spend a lot of time worrying about how that would be done. OK, let me close that for the moment. Let's actually do some review with that picture. I still have it open here. OK, key to our understanding of this thing are the fact that the state registers themselves are flip-flops, each one. So for every state value you have, you know, if I have a state that looks like, did that actually turn itself off? It did. Huh. One, zero, one, zero. And I know that's the name of the state. I know there are four flip-flops in my machine. 
They are only inside the state register. They're never in the combinational logic because combinational means is not clocked. Right? We well, could do some timings and things with these having to do with whether or not uh, you know the uh, propagation delay or the setup and hold times matter, and they do. But for now, we'll assume the combinational logic is pretty much right now, and we'll make the clocks be slow enough that it won't matter. Well, we got flip flops in here, so there's four of them. We learned that given a particular number, if somebody says, "Oh, my problem, I've got to have a thousand different states," how many state bits are the minimum we're going to need in order to represent a thousand items? Somebody just tell me. Ten. Ten. Ten that's right. Ten. Good. Good. Two to the tenth is ten twenty-four. It's a bigger number, so we know we could do it in that. Could we do it in seven bits? Again. No. Well, if we need ten bits, we certainly can't squeeze it into seven. Could we do it in thirteen bits? Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. You can always use too many bits. And there could be good design reasons for doing that, particularly if the number of bits match your outputs. You know, if I have a thousand things to represent and the actual bits I'm representing are really scattered, take, take a problem like, uh, where do I have someplace I'm drawing? Well, I'm drawing in here, but I think I have another one. Nope. I have a theater. Here's the stage. Audience is sitting out here, orchestra sitting right there. Okay, front of the stage. Each of these little sections of the stage have been divided off as though they are scenes. Above each is a light. I know this is not a good 3D picture. When this light's on, it illuminates this area. This one illuminates that area. This illuminates this area. Now, I have the notion in my, you know, uh, lighting guy's script of being in a particular state. Currently, I need one, two, three. I need areas one and three lit. On the next cue you get, which is a clock, Q-U-E-U-E, -U -E -U -E, not the Star Trek spelling. On the next queue, you get, I need only number two lit. On the next queue, I need one, two, and three. And then I need to drop back to one and two. And, oh, yeah, you need a queue in there, don't you? Because there needs to be a clock to change you. Well, I'm producing these outputs. But let's expand this to what I probably need as well. I've got some footlights. You know, maybe there's, a, let's actually label them with X's for now just to count them. I got a set of different footlights. Maybe I have four different colors of lights that I can use down here shining up on the stage. Of course, I have my three overhead lights. I may have a master spotlight. Even though somebody's moving it, I have to turn it on and off. I might have some things that shine up on the back when I want to illuminate you know, just the back of the stage. Now, I'm up to, you know, what do I have? I have 11 bits, so I can do 2,048 things. But I don't need to do two of them because I don't have that many different cues, and, I, and sometimes they're the same number again. But I still have this many outputs. It may be actually more practical for me to represent it in terms of what lights I need to be turned on as the name of my state. Of course, I'll need 11 flip-flops. Hey, but flip-flops are cheap. I most certainly won't use 2,048 combinations. But I'll be able to exactly look at this. I can look at my state name and know exactly which lights are on. So for somebody out there that's doing the lighting in a theater, that may be a lot more sensible than saying, oh, yeah, you're going to use Q number 314. I have no number idea what that is in binary. It might be better to say, 
will separate for you. This is your footlights. This is your stage lights. This is your backlight or that was spotlight backlights. And let him just look and see what's going on. Some lights on his board. So we could certainly build a state machine that could give cues and say when to change the lighting. And that's a typical use of a state machine. Something that would be used in a setting like this where we need to turn on lights. We need them to happen in prescribed combinations and orders. And we could build the combinational logic to do that. Of course, what we just said is we might have some large number of inputs, which are our next states and current states, but they don't need much decoding to produce the outputs. This decoding right here is the thing. These were our O sub n's that we required. Let's call it O sub k to match his notation here. This is our current state right here, which we were calling S you know, sub j down to zero. We never had zero of these. Obviously, we never had zero of these, but we could have zero of the inputs. We don't necessarily have to have inputs. Maybe we just take the last state and turn it into a new state. We use the clock in our last picture. That would be the queue to cause it to move. Or maybe we have a queue associated with some inputs. Maybe some of the lights are turned on on a particular queue, but only on Friday nights because we have a different actor and they need to do something at a different part of the stage that's, you know, something different. Yeah. So we could have a reason for mixing in inputs there. But the main combinational logic, the outputs of this, what do we produce in terms of equations? Well, the combinational logic in this state is going to either produce equations from T Let's call it, uh, I'm going to use n right now, dn down to t0, or our flip-flops might be from dn down to 0. So those would all be equations. That's a d. Or they might be jk pairs, or each are jn, kn, down to j0, k0. You might say, well, why would anybody ever use a JK when a toggle was so easy? Well, so you would try all three, and you would see which one generated the least amount of combinational logic so that it would be cheaper to build. Remember, we have a go-to for both JKs and Ds. This is a 7474 we're using here, and we don't didn't name it, but it's a uh, JK MS type that we'd be using here of one of the varieties of TTL. P, we didn't talk about actually getting one. We said we'd only use that if we were putting it in an integrated circuit. So for now, we can't just name a TTL chip to go look for propagation delay times and things. But we could do that. We also could figure out what those times were because we can take, and in any of these we have, generate logic to make it happen. We know that way back, well, we don't need our excitation table right now. But we do have, uh, was it on the other page? No, oh, I've probably erased it. We do have, uh, when we ultimately finish one of these things, a set of equations. So if we had this and we had implemented it using D flip-flops, we have 11 bits here. We would have equations for D10 all the way down to D0. Because that's how many flip-flops we have. And all of our outputs would be just simply the state names. So we would really basically have output D10 down to output 0. But we know what they are. That's equal to S10. That's equal to S zero if we made it so that the state name was literally the outputs. So while we create a lot more of those, we can create a lot fewer of these. It would be a balancing thing, and you get good at it over time. You'd have to design a few to say, oh, that's what I really want to do, or that's not what I want to do. Okay, let me erase this, and um, let's look at another problem for a second. Um, Let me look at my homework sheets here and see if I had, I think I have a little something for you to do for homework. 
just to practice. We're obviously going to be covering this topic again on Monday. It's Wednesday, right? I always get that wrong. I think today's Wednesday. So we'll do it next Monday. And um, you guys will be quite good at it if you've practiced. But I'm going to give you a little homework to work on, and I encourage you to get together and work together on it. You know, obviously, by get together, I mean using Discord or something else. I was on Discord working with some students earlier today because uh, they were in the middle of some things working together, and they happened to be from different classes. So I couldn't really put them in Blackboard easily and have them talk about the, uh, the homework assignment. So I'm going to make this really simple for you so that you can do it you know, in a limited amount of time. But I would suggest at least check your answers with somebody else. If not, uh, do the problem with somebody so that you know what to do. But don't let them do it for you. You're going to need to know because you'll have your own individual uh, state machine to build on the exam. And you don't want to rely on somebody else getting done because that exam takes all the time I give you. It's not like I'm going to give you a lot of luxury time. You're going to literally take the time you need. OK, I'm going to take and put four states. Let's just draw the zeros first here. I'll fill in the detail as we go. And this should be almost a piece of cake if you paid attention tonight. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to label my states in gray code order. And I'm going to give them an output. OK, and the outputs are going to be a 1 when it's 0, 0. It's going to produce a 0 when it's 0, 1. It's going to produce a 0 when it's 1, 1. And it's going to produce a 1 when it's 1, 0. We'll assume this to be the start state up here although that's not critical for our working. And then what we're going to assume is we have arrows from each to the next. And we have arrows going back to the previous. Now, since we have multiple arrows, we got to say when. We're going to go around the circle clockwise if we have a zero for the input. If, however, we're in a state and we get a one, we're going to head back to the previous state. So the teacher says you're going to use D flip-flops, and you're going to have to produce the equations where D1 is equal to something, D0 is equal to something, and O0 is equal to something. So we have two D flip-flops. We know that because there's two state bits. We have one output, and we have one input. The input could be either 0 or 1, of course, and we have a pattern. If I'm in state 0, 0, I get a 0, I go to 1. I go to 3, I go to 2, I go to 0. If, however, I get to a state of 0, 0, I get here and somebody puts a 1, I start heading back. So the output controls which, or the input controls which direction we're going to go. And the output is basically the single value for those states. Mostly ones here, mostly zeros there. Now, you are going to turn this in. I don't care if you work together and you both do it type of thing, or the three of you do it. This is do your own working so when I ask you questions about it on Monday, you won't be like, oh, 25? You know, you're, you're kind of going to make sense out of what, you, what I ask you. The way you're going to turn it in 
is you're going to email it to me with only these three equations between angle brackets in a text file. I don't have anything for you to download, so you're going to create a text file. The only thing in the text file is going to be angle bracket and your answer, close angle bracket. Separate your equations with a space. Make sure the number is not subscripts, rather they're, you know, so you're going to have D1 equals. Now, equals, it was not something, this is not the correct answer. You'll use an exclamation point, so not S1. Notice in this equation, there are no spaces. And there'd be a space, perhaps. I'm going to use a caret to indicate a space. Then you'd put the D0 answer. No spaces after the angle bracket. Just start the angle bracket right against the D. However, you will not be penalized for having a space after the angle or before the last one. If it just feels better for you to have that extra space in there, you can do it. Now, your mission is to create a text file Create the answer in its correct form and email it to me before class starts on Monday. You can wait till 5.59 to send it, but make sure I have it before 6 o'clock on Monday. I'm giving you, you don't have to turn it in tonight, and early doesn't matter. I'd much rather you spend time working it and going over the notes on this because this is very important and will be very important on the exam and on the next exam and on the final exam. This is stuff you couldn't have done without all the things we have learned in the last lessons. Most of the groundwork we've set now are doing real things in this. So I need you to get together. I need you to study best you can as a group whenever you can. I need you to work the problems as individually as hand, but don't go down the wrong path too far without asking somebody. Anybody have any questions about what my expectations are? So the only thing you want in the text file is the answer, nothing else. That's it. Okay. And make sure you, of course, make the subject be COS-210-010. Do you want us to title the text file anything specific? Nope. Oh, but make sure it ends .txt. Right. Okay. And make sure that what's in there is a text file. Don't send me a Word doc that you've just renamed a .txt. If I right. can't read it, it's wrong. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anybody have any other questions? I think it's almost time for us to start shutting the doors and go see if there's a hamburger waiting for me in the other room, which I think there is. Any questions? I okay, well, let's, one. yeah, okay, William. Go ahead. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to ask this, but the whole thing, whole process seems to be about optimizing your circuitry. Why on earth would you build a one-hot, since that seems to be completely wasteful? Because in a one-hot, you don't have as many chances where you can get glitches or get hazards. And so the chances of getting an error if you properly wire up a one hot are a lot less because you can detect the fact that you have two bits turned on and not do anything. And so the reason has more, it doesn't have to do with optimization of parts. It has to do with optimization of, I can't allow this to make a mistake. I can't allow it to have a glitch. And so often you can run one hots at a faster speed. So that's the reason. Uh huh. And there's other reason, but that's that's the main reason. Good, good question. That don't be embarrassed about that. That was a good question. Any other questions? And you guys, I will see you. I think it's Wednesday, right? Let me look at my phone. I got to make sure. Last weekend, I think I told you the wrong day. Yeah, today's Wednesday. So I shall see you, fine folk, on Monday evening at six. And you will have already sent me the homework, so you'll all be nice, cool, and relaxed at that point. Have a good night and be gone.